Hi everyone, welcome, thank you for clicking. This video is a review of the effects of RF EMF, or radio frequency electromagnetic fields, on humans, as you've seen from us before, but this one is an attempt to give a whole picture over the past five years. And as always, you can find the summary on our website and I will post a link for that below. With the emergence of 5G, the technological debate has sprung up again. Not for the first time, uncertainty between causal effects have arisen and the burden of proof is being called into question. This has stemmed endless debate and controversy. The end result? Who can say? Uh, what we do know is that there is heavy support leading to the potential links. This is science for we see evidence but need more support. The terms used in scientific research are rarely stark enough to conclude beyond a shadow of a doubt, but the media often takes them that way. It is, after all, far more interesting. However, this review is simply to say that there is evidence, and under the scientific method of the precautionary principle alone, we must make changes to how things are done around here. And where should the studies continue in order to reach a solid conclusion? What is keeping us from re reaching a consensus? The telecom industry conducts its own studies. They are often heavily funded and therefore quite thorough. The only issue is, can you say the results are valid when there was massive funding bias involved? The legislation being written on the issue for safety standards is also heavily Im influenced by the industry itself. You can see Hardell and Carberg in below, um, how it is that deemed to be unbiased. Does that even matter? When it comes to our health, the answer is yes, it does. When it comes to the outcome, we shall see. Dr. John Frank um, states that there is a lack of clarity as to what the technology, what technology is included in 5G. There is a growing number of laboratory studies documenting disruptive in vitro and in vivo research showing effects, but with gaps and a lack of high quality epidemiological studies for 5G specifically. But many of the past generations of RF, EMF, and persistent allegations that the telecommunications regulatory authorities do not base their safety guidelines on current scientific evidence related to the unmanaged conflict of interest. 5G technology, based on its design, which is a cell structure, so they have very short waves and it means they need to have a lot of base stations in order to carry, like, have signal over a large area, would leave very little safe spaces or zones where there is no to little little to no EMF. For those who have a compromised immune system or are prone to the effects already, this will make life very difficult, or more so than it already is. Uh, the reason 5G is considered safe is because it is going to be at power levels much lower than the current safety standard limits. However, there is evidence, plenty of evidence, that levels much lower can have an effect on cell proliferation, genotoxicity, gene expression, cell membrane function, cell signaling, and a variety of other effects. Now, why is this still debatable? Many of these studies are not replicated or replicable, and sometimes they have a lower quality standard for methods. Is this a funding issue? You are kind of taking the perspective of the underdog after all. And epidemiologically, it is next to impossible to test for, as there are virtually no control groups left, and the effects are nonlinear. Russell, again below, uh, heavily suggests a precautionary rollout for 5G. Obviously, current studies are enough to invoke the precautionary principle already, but who could say? So, what does this mean for potential health outcomes? There are so many potential issues. So Verbeek et al. Surve uh, surveyed experts, and the results were cancer, obviously, um, heat-related effects. That is obviously not an issue for the current debate because that those are already what current safety standards are based on. So it's not so much of a concern for this theory. And adverse birth outcomes, EHS or electromagnetic hypersensitivity, cognitive impairment, inauspicious pregnancy outcomes, and oxidative stress. A nice way to say spontaneous abortions. Uh, the authors then go on to categorize the importance of these outcomes based on the experts surveyed opinions. Uh, this is relevant because it can actually direct research focus. Old safety standards did not include long-term exposures, obviously, because they were written a long time ago and they, people hadn't been exposed for very long, and didn't consider exposures for greater than 10 years. 
This is impossible to test for, obviously, and so the precautionary approach should have already been taken into account. The mechanisms for this are primarily oxidative stress in cells. So this means that EMF stresses the cells causing the production of ROSs or reactive oxygen species and even RNSs or reactive nitrogen species. Depending on where it is affected, it can lead to many things such as cancer, diabetes, congenital malformations, and neurodegenerative syndromes. The production of ROS has already been very well documented and we just haven't reached a consensus yet. So you can see Sherman and Mevison again below. Okay, so you have EHS to some degree. Now what? Well, 45% uh, of people uh, that were actually, you know, correctly diagnosed and surveyed uh, noticed a difference after receiving counseling. So this means that you measure your environment and you change your sleeping arrangements accordingly. Two thirds of these individuals actually chose to use the reduction as a principal tool. Um, Balia et al. suggests the approach, this approach for general physicians. One, take a history of health and is uh, other health related issues and measure EMF exposure. Two, medical examinations and what are those findings. Three, measurements of the EMF exposure. Four, reprodu uh, reduction and prevention of EMF exposure. Then five, you can lead to a diagnosis. Then six is obviously treatment of patient and environment. There are currently no questionnaires available, available to help practitioners in this though. Medical examination should include uh, nitric oxide production, uh, mito mitochondriopathy, oxidative stress, lipid peroxidation or MDA LDL, inflammation of the TNF alpha, IFN GABA inducible protein 10 or IP10, IL1B, histamine, melatonin, and melatonin status. Uh, a full list of additional suggested diagnostic techniques can be found in the author's study. Long term, a great many large scale studies such as the NTP and like the Rev and the Ramazzini Institute study have suggested changing the current levels and standards, as well as changing the classification from 2B as a possible carcinogen all the way up to 1 as a definite carcinogen. And this is stated by Wall et al. again below. So when it comes to measuring something you cannot see, what works well for the average Joe? Well, a meter or perhaps more discreetly, a wearable detector. So as Razadinsky et al. completed a study utilizing their own creation of an antenna measurement device focused entirely on the head. It determined that it would also be, they determined that it would also be beneficial uh, to measure from other points on the body, such as the arms or the legs, and also using different antenna devices and ground planes. A communication device worn close to the body often increases its transmission rates in order to maintain radio links. This means, you guessed it, an increase in SAR, which is specific absorption rate, which is what our current safety standards are based on. So the authors suggest another idea for the industry. Optimize radio links and the overall design of your devices so that you don't have to increase power output levels. Shocking, I know. So, a multifaceted stratagem is the solution. Reduce exposure, increase device efficiency, make appropriate standards, and decrease allowable exposure rates. For what? For the sake of all of our health? Yeah. Not just humans, but the overall environment as well. And so that was that is the end of our discussion. Um, if you have any comments, questions, concerns, please state them below. And thank you so much for sticking with us.